Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Hello, welcome to Celebrating Act 2 with our virtual gourmet, John Mariani, and my partner, John Coleman. How are you doing, guys? Good. Very well. Hey, John Mariani, good to see you again. You are the gourmet among us, and uh, I am the... What's the opposite of gourmet? I'm the... I'm the fast food fan. Slum. Yeah, fast food, okay. <laughs> and it seems to me, that there's lots of fast food, but it seems to me that the hamburger is the ubiquitous American fast food. Mm -hmm. And I guess the hamburger, I don't know that the hamburger is uniquely American at all, but it does seem to be probably the most common food in America and you know people argue over how to cook it and what should go into it and let's hear Honor, from the gourmet right. virtual gourmet tell me about the best hamburger you've ever had I'll run up to that let's go back in history because what you say is the hamburger uh, American uh, yes if you're talking about a ground meat patty on a round bun of a certain softness, yes, that is definitely an American. I don't even want to call it a creation because um, it doesn't come from Hamburg um, and it doesn't have any ham in it. Um, but there was always, always in America and Germany and elsewhere ground meat, ground meat patties, meat loaf, and so forth. The distinction seems to be um, part of the American character. It was a patty quickly cooked and put on a bun and taken away and eaten. Now, you could eat it at a diner counter or you could take it home and put it in a sack, buy them by the sack, said uh, White Castle, you know, which are steamed hamburgers. And that was specifically American because we had to have a, uh, you know, uh, eat them and get up and go, grab them, grab a bite sort of attitude towards our, our food. In Europe and the rest of the world, you sit down and you have your meal, your lunch. As a matter of fact, lunch is largely in the rest of the world the main meal of the day. Um, and then you have soup or something uh, at night or a plate of pasta or rice, whatever. Um, in America, that's not the case. Whereas we, you know, we didn't invent the sandwich. It's named after the Earl of Sandwich, a British guy who was playing uh, gambling all night and he needs something to eat. So he put some meat behind between two slices of bread, blah, blah, blah. Um, but the sandwich became an American phenomenon too. Um, just as pizza, which was invented in Naples, but much more American than anything else. So the hamburger did appear at some point in the 19th century under that name, okay? And it became a fast food. And as you alluded to, John, there's fast food and there's fast food. Uh, one of the distinctions of American gastronomy, using a big word, is that our fast food takes myriad forms um, in every ethnic category. Uh, Italian food, pizza, uh, Mexican food, tacos, Chinese food, um, uh, chow mein, uh, so forth and so on. And uh, hamburgers fit right into that. So do hot dogs, which were just sausages, German sausages. But again, put on a soft yeast bun. In that case, you usually slice down the middle to fit the hamburger. Okay. And historians like myself would try to tra trace the R's. Okay, but it was, and they all, all these things have been simply delicious and simply good. What has happened in uh, marketing is that, first of all, you had these fast food slash junk food franchises, <clears throat> which I include to have um, McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, a bunch of the others. Um, which serve a measly piece of terrible, it's not terrible meat so far, it's bad meat. It's terrible because it has no flavor whatsoever. I mean, people say, hey, do you go to McDonald's? That's why I crave McDonald's. No, I don't. Not because it's fast food, but because it just tastes terrible to me. And they all do. Although I have a certain soft spot in my head uh, for um, White Castle, which about once every 10 years, I like those crazy steam buns with chopped onions on them, uh, squashed, and you can pop them in your mouth and eat about four or five of them with a bottle of cream soda or grape soda and be perfectly satisfied. What happened was that post uh, 
junk food franchises, uh, the, the hamburger has taken on a life of its own so that the bigger is not the better, the more elaborate, the more expensive. The first sign of this was about 12, 13 years ago when a very haute cuisine French chef named Daniel Ballou here in New York, who had a restaurant, Daniel, which cost about $250 to eat at. He opened another little place, which was uh, to appeal for a lower, lo lower price, a bistro. And uh, it was called uh, Café Boulou. And there he served a hamburger for the lunch crowd. As a joke, he put on short ribs, he put on foie gras, he put on gruyere cheese, he put on black truffles, put it on a homemade bun, about this, like this, stuck a toothpick in it with French fries and charged fifty-five dollars for it. <laughs> well, took off like wildfire, so that you know um, McDonald's uh, sold by the billions. We sold billions of him. Um, he he said after ten years, we must have sold a million of these things. He says I never expected it, it was a joke. Well. That was the um, uh, that broke the dam, so that everybody had to compete to make a better hamburger by making it more extravagant, and they could charge more, of course. So now it's become in the last few years, especially during COVID, when people are eating uh, eating in or or ordering in, that the hamburger has become a weekly uh, discussion. In New York Magazine, Los Angeles Magazine, San Francisco Magazine, Chicago Magazine, all the newspapers, the Times Picayune in New Orleans, the Miami Times, every single week, the best new hamburger, better than last week's. Oh yeah, this is even better. Or the ten best hamburger places in Chicago. Uh, it, it's and all of them are have been elaborated to the point where it's almost like you forget about the meat and the bun. It's everything else that is in there. It's it's the pickles. It's three types of cheese. It's putting on taco sauce. It's putting on barbecue sauce. It's putting on uh, all sorts of things that you would never have seen before on a hamburger, which doesn't make it any better necessarily. As a matter of fact, it makes it into something which is usually highly indigestible um, and something you take a bite out of and it you know it comes goes goes down your your chin. Oh man, this is like awesome. Well, to me, that's not what a hamburger is. It's like taking French fries. And doing the same thing to them. Everybody loves French fries. Everybody likes hamburgers. What what is the best condiment for French fries? Ketchup, or if you happen to be in um, in Europe, uh, uh, in Belgium, mayonnaise, which is pretty good. Stick it in mayonnaise. Okay. But that's it. Once you start elaborating on a French fry or a baked potato, which gets piled up now with caviar on top and then scooped out and put back in, it becomes another thing, and it loses the shall I say the soulfulness of what the item should be as something soul satisfying as something that we remember from my childhood as tasting delicious in a certain way and which was no big deal except that it was an american um uh, icon and that american icon is a bun with some uh, meat in it and some cheese it could be melted yellow cheddar um it could be even Velveeta, I don't much approve of that, but and you could throw a couple of pickles on the side uh, if you want. But to me, it's all about how that meat co is cooked and the quality of the meat itself and the quality of the cheese and the quality of the bun. Um, to me, the best franchise by far for hamburgers is Fuddruckers. I don't even know how many Fuddruckers there are anymore. Um, they originated uh, in the South. In uh, I think in Austin, Texas, uh, San Antonio, Texas, I was the original Fud Rockers, and they proliferated. The problem was that because they cooked them to order, it takes like five or six minutes to get your order, and people didn't want. They were so used to going to McDonald's, and within one minute and ten seconds, they had a whole bag of this junk food. Um, but Fud Rockers, you got a juicy, wonderful hamburger um, with cheese on it if you wanted. <clears throat> with a homemade toasted bun. Um, and that to me is the best franchise out there. Do I eat hamburgers out? Um, yeah, on occasion. There's a place which you may still remember here, John, 
uh, where I live in Westchester, in Eastchester, called the Piper's Kilt. And for years that used to win, before people were ranking hamburger joints, um, number one um, hamburger in Westchester. They still make a superior, superb hamburger. Um, and one of the reasons is because they make them to order. They'll take a little ball of meat, freshly ground, they grind themselves, and they pat it to exactly the right thickness, which they've learned after a million of them to get, and they sear it and cook it the right way. Most hamburger places, most restaurants buy the patties frozen or at best um, fresh meat, but they've already been put between wax paper by some company somewhere and it's, it's shipped in. So you have a constant supply. That's not what I call it. As with anything, cook to order means cook to order uh, the way you like it. And um, that's why I go back. So um, I really regret that the food media have glommed onto a constant ad nauseum book of lists for pizzas and uh, and uh, hamburgers which is all out of whack with what these things should be and taste like right i agree i hate to be uh, debbie downer here but um because of the pandemic uh, not only has soup plantation closed its doors but Ruckers, at least in california uh near us has closed because they have that open section where you could get all your own fixins and put yeah. it on, and uh, they had a pretty expensive. Uh, uh, they were in a, really a dine-in, as opposed to take take out a restaurant. I don't think yeah. they uh, they adapted. Uh, but I, uh, I agree that uh, I'm a vegan now. But when I was eating, first of all, I survived college uh, with White Castle to get a sack full on the way home, and uh, it, it never I... made it home. Uh, mm -hmm. You ate it in the car on the way home or on the subway. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I would say, though, uh, for me, because now uh, the, there are some alternatives, most of them pretty awful, uh, but uh, the Impossible Burger seems to have gotten the texture just about right, and they're going to get better uh, for a faux, a plant-based. Excuse Isn't me? Isn't there a raging out there about In-N-Out burgers and fat burgers? Yeah, fat burgers are still uh, doing quite well, and In and Out is probably not only uh, uh, for hamburgers great for for a variety of reasons. They're family owned, uh, but it's a great job. There are people there who start out uh, uh, making fries or cutting uh, the tomatoes or what have you, and they move up and they're making eighty, a hundred, hundred fifty thousand dollars a year running the restaurants. It's very, very, very well run, and. Yep. Um, uh, it's, uh, if you're if you're into hamburgers, in and out, just about the best. What about you, uh, uh, Coleman? You're, uh, uh, you... Well, I I have to admit that I am not a gourmand, uh, and for me, uh, a good juicy hamburger, call it greasy if you will, good juicy hamburger is important, but also the the atmosphere. The ambiance of my burger joint is important. Mm -hmm. And when I was in New York, John Mariani, visiting you, I had to stop by my old haunt in Nourishell, where that right at the Pelham Nourishell borderline. We all knew it as Greasy Nicks, and it's what is it? still there. They still they use a Kaiser roll. They still <laughs> make great burgers. And what they is serve it now. They, they sell corn, corn on the cob, with doused with butter. Something Nick's, greasy Nick's. Actually, I I, I want to give credit to the true name of the place. It's the Lino Brothers Clam Bar. That's what it is. Oh. Lino Brothers Clam Bar. Been there for generations. Now, uh, one of the Lino Brothers' sons runs it, and the last uh, it's I just as good as it ever was. It's when, when did you? It was just recently because the last time I drove by, it was closed. Well, they, you know what they do? They close for the winter. Oh. Uh, the Lino brothers were a, a, a great pair. Before the Lino brothers, there was a guy named Nick, and he literally uh, built the place. But he was not, he's a big fat guy, and everybody assumed that he greased up the hamburgers by putting them under his arm. <laughs> Maybe he did. That, that <laughs> never deterred anybody from going there and buying those burgers. Anyway, Greasy Nicks, I'm, I'm, in light 
how do I say this, in honor of the Lino brothers, I want the people who go there, you know, it's just a little side, a brick place off to the side. In fact, here's another little thing. If you, those of us who might know some of the music from the 30s will know Glen Island Casino. You, you, oh. I grew up near there, so I know it well. But if you've ever heard music from the 30s, Glen Island Casino was a big dance spot, big place where big bands played. And it's down the road, less than a mile from the Lino Brothers Clam Bar. And for years, ever since I grew up, for years, there was a sign at the top of the Lino Brothers Clam Bar that said Glen Island Casino. And it had a little arrow that said, you know, just down the road. Nobody ever saw the arrow. They all stopped at Greasy Nick's thinking that was Glen Island <laughs> Casino. <laughs> Where's the? How could they put a big band in this little patio? I don't know. But anyway, yeah. Lino it's Brothers are still there, or the sun is still there, and I recommend. It ain't gourmet, but it's awfully good. Well, I, I want uh, since uh, White Castle, uh, uh, just as a sort of epilogue here, White Castle uh, is basically East Coast phenomenon. Although I'm sure yes. they have yeah. gravitated someplace. There's probably one in Las Vegas, as there is a, a Nathan's uh, uh, in Las Vegas. But White Castle, about uh, eight or nine years ago, like Entermans, started uh, uh, shipping them all over the country. And White Castle actually had the frozen White Castles when I used to eat those things. You buy them and you just pipe them in the, uh, put them in the microwave. And yep. they taste just about the same as uh, uh, getting them off the grill. Yeah, Elvis so. was known for ordering by the hundreds. Send him, send him to uh, to Graceland for all his buddies, and uh, have him shipped in FedEx overnight, and or just driven down from St. Louis or something. But uh, that, see, what, what that, whatever you think of the hamburgers at White Castle, what their shtick was, what they sold was that hamburger joints were known as greasy spoons before that, and before, this is before McDonald's. Their ads, their building, and the use of the word white was to say, no, we are spick and span. We yeah. are very clean. And clean. we have changed our forms and our hats and stuff all day long. And you can be assured you're going to get a good quality meat uh, as opposed to at the greasy spoons. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's interesting because the hamburger is truly American. In Europe, do they have hamburgers? I guess so, but not to the same degree. Oh, yeah, now they do all over the place. Yeah. Because of McDonald's, if no other reason. Yeah, that's true. That's They're not true. as crazy about the McDonald's over there as they are here. Um, when the first McDonald's opened in Rome, I mean, there were protests, which led to the what was called a slow food movement um, uh -huh. uh, because of McDonald's. And that led to the Italy vast food grocery stores uh, that started out. So that you can thank McDonald's for that. As a side note, uh, uh, when I was, uh, I had an assignment in Australia for about a year and a half. And uh, the McDonald's over there, the standard uh, Big Mac had a slice of uh, sliced beet, uh, B E T, red beet, on them, and it's actually quite delicious. Um, and uh, that was their standard uh, uh, hamburger over there because sliced beets well, would be found on most meals uh, in uh, at least in Melbourne, where I was stationed most of the time. So uh, there are variations of that even with the chains around the world uh, for local uh, consumption, yeah. uh, putting something that they'll like on it. Yeah. I don't know what they do in India where a large portion of the population does not eat beef at all, but... Uh, well, maybe, they're, maybe they're into impossible max, because uh, that, that, that is, as a substitute, it's a pretty close to the texture of ground meat that you might buy uh, uh, at a butcher and and uh, form yourself and throw it on the grill uh, other than it was already pre-shaped but uh, they're, they're working on those things but anyway uh john and john yes uh, hamburgers uh, i grew up on them uh, most americans have and uh, it is an all-american all treat so thank you for a trip down uh, memory lane my pleasure for more on celebrating act two visit our webpage. follow us on facebook subscribe to us on youtube and tell your friends, Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life.